So first question is, um, in dying for a paycheck, your appeal to us is to stop the unnecessary carnage, as you describe it, um, of the workplace, uh, the workplace all over the world, uh, which you say is, is literally killing people in effect. Um, and I wonder if you can summarize what the key evidence is and what the main causes are. Well, the evidence is uh, the evidence is the following. We did um, first of all a meta analyses meta analyses of um, ten workplace practices on uh, four outcomes: self-reported um, physical health, self-reported mental health, having a physician diagnosed illness, and um, mortality. And uh, we found uh, the meta analyses reveal that uh, most of these workplace practices are as harmful to health as secondhand smoke, a known and regulated carcinogen. And then when you build a model and try to combine the effects of all of these um, workplace practices to get an overall estimate of the toll in the United States, uh, the estimate is about 120,000 deaths per year and about $190 billion in excess costs which would make the workplace the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, okay. And the workplace practices involved are things like long working hours, shift work, and absence of job control, which was talked about in the famous Whitehall studies many years ago, uh, economic insecurity, work family conflict, things that basically uh, place stress on the employee. Okay, and there's, I mean, there's, there's, the figures are staggering. They primarily relate to the US, but from what I read in the book, there's plenty of evidence that the same characteristics are playing out in many countries worldwide. That's exactly right. I mean, there was a study published in, in China uh, that we didn't do that says that one million people a year are dying from overwork in China. Uh, the World Health Organization um, has estimates that there are 850,000 deaths a year, 24 million um, 24 million years lost, lost of human life. Um, if you look at the Health and Safety Executive, um, which is uh, in the United Kingdom, they estimate that 60% of all uh, workdays lost uh, for absenteeism are due to stress. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, there's stress surveys of stress in Australia, uh, stress in Canada. This is truly a worldwide problem, and it's a significant problem, and it's a significant cost problem. Um, many studies, the Centers for Disease Control in the US, and then studies around the world, including by the World Economic Forum, will tell you the most healthcare cost goes to treating chronic disease. Uh, chronic disease comes importantly from stress and behaviors such as smoking and drinking and drug use that um, stress induces, uh, and stress comes mostly from work. So the workplace has literally become a public health crisis. Uh, but it's interesting that although that's the case and there's plenty of evidence, it's not the workplace that's actually meeting the costs. No, that is right. The costs have been externalized to the larger society. So one of the things I say to executives is that you ought to get ahead of this problem because sooner or later governments are not going to permit this uh, to continue. Well, yeah, the cash strap governments they can't afford to keep paying for the public health system are going to want to look at companies internalizing these costs in the same way that they have done with some of the environmental externalities, yeah? That's exactly correct. You interestingly make a comparison between the environmental externalities, um, which you call an eco-sustainability issue, and this as a social sustainability issue. Could you just explain what you mean by the social sustainability and why you think we don't pay as much attention to that as we do to the eco-sustainability? Well, the second question I'm not sure I can answer, but the first I can certainly answer. Um, I, when, when, when people go to work at a company, um, uh, when they show up there in the morning to go to work, uh, they have entrusted in a very fundamental way uh, their physical and psychological well-being uh, to their employer. Uh, there's a colleague of... Uh, who runs a company who says, according to the Mayo Clinic, the person you report to at work is as important for your health as your family doctor. And I, that's clearly got to be the case. So the, so the question then becomes, what happens when people go 
uh, to work? And do the leaders for whom they go to work feel a sense of stewardship, in the true sense of stewardship, over those people and their well-being? And for reasons that I actually can't understand or quite, quite explain, uh, many, many organizations today do take a feeling of stewardship over the physical environment. They worry about their carbon footprint. They worry about their recycling. They worry about doing things in a environmentally sustainable way. But when it comes to human sustainability, for some reason, uh, they don't take nearly as much care. Well, do you think the reason is related to the fact that they can externalize much of the cost and they're not really fully aware of the opportunity cost, which comes across in disengaged or and not motivated employees, not very productive employees or not as productive as they could be? In other well, words, so it's value not added rather than value lost. Yeah, I think I think the measurement issue is is clearly a piece of it. But I also think that many people see humans as agentic. And so, you know, what I've had people say to me is, you look, if the employee is stressed, let them go find another job or let them find a, a different place. So there's a different sense of responsibility, which has led to this weird situation where we seem to care more about polar bears than we do about human beings. You also mentioned the, about the importance of language, that we actually use language that needs to be changed. Yes, we, we talk about human resources and human capital um, and everything, of course, we talk about in terms of money. So the question is, what does it cost and how much is it worth and this, that and the other thing. And I believe that we ought to prioritize human life, uh, that human life is sacred. Um, you know, the, one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. Um, I believe you shouldn't kill people in the workplace, just like you shouldn't kill them outside of the workplace. And just going back to the issue of the, the cost and the fact that it's being externalized, to be clear, the health system is um, one of the largest payers, but the largest payer is actually the employee themselves. And as far as I can work out, it seems like the workplace that's causing the problem is only picking up around about 20% of the cost. That's probably right. And I, sh and I should point out that it is interesting that the direct cost of the health system are of course large, staggering, um, but the indirect costs, many studies suggest are five times as high in things that you've already mentioned. Absenteeism, presenteeism, being there but not really being engaged, turnover, there are surveys that show that to the extent that employees are stressed at work, they are much more likely to quit. So, uh, so the, these indirect costs of presenteeism, absenteeism, uh, employee disengagement and turnover are actually five times as large as the direct costs. So, well, so you're talking about a lot of money. In the United States, it's a trillion dollars a year. Uh, I was quite surprised by the number of people in one of the surveys that gave the reason of stress at work as the reason they left their jobs. The, the, the percentage was really high. Yes, uh, that, that, is, that is correct. And one of the other staggering things is that a, the one survey that was done uh, suggest that 61% um, that, um, of people said that they had missed work because of workplace stress, and 7%, which is a relatively high number, said that they had been hospitalized. So, yeah. so, so we're, we're talking about serious health outcomes uh, that ought to be addressed. Well, and when we get to the issue of death caused by this, there's obviously the death due to the chronic illnesses and so on, but the other staggering figures are around suicide and homicide. Yes, there's a lot of workplace violence caused by workplace stress. And certainly the, the evidence suggests that for people who are laid off, the risk of suicide goes up by two and a half times. And this also is an inequality issue, yes? Because one of the figures that is amazing is that it has a, up to a 20 year difference in somebody's life expectancy, depending on the type of work they're doing. Yes, that is, uh, well, it's not a def fully 20 years. There's a difference in, in 20 years in life expectancy between the longest lived and less long lived counties in the United States. And about a third of that inequality is due to the different conditions uh, that people get sorted into at work. So, yeah, so if the, there, is, there is no question. If you think about the causes of workplace stress and illness, um, layoffs, uh, absence of job control, work-family conflict, 
in the United States, absence of access to health insurance, those things really do depend upon your level of education, that high, higher educated people and better jobs are likely to have more job control, are likely to have better access to health care, are unlikely to do shift work, and are likely to get work family um, accommodation uh, that helps them deal with these other responsibilities. So there is no question that a lot of the inequality we observe around the world in, uh, in health outcomes comes from these differential exposures uh, to the workplace conditions. Although you do also stress that it does cut across all kinds of professions. So I remember the example of alcoholism amongst lawyers uh, was one of the illustrations. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a wonderful New York Times article called The Lawyer Comment, uh, comma, the, uh, the Addict, which talks about um, uh, the problems that lawyers face for, with both drug addiction and alcoholism. And what's interesting, and I think the law illustrates this perfectly, and you see this also with doctors, there's a very high rate of physician burnout, at least in the United States. There's a very high rate of physician addiction because of course they can write their own prescriptions. There are huge problems in the law with both alcoholism and drug abuse. And the, if you go to the American Bar Association, um, you will see studies and white papers and working groups. And similarly at the American Medical Association and similarly, you can see with respect to um, workplace health in general, you can see you know, studies, the CIPD in the United Kingdom has just done a study of this um, and they talk about absenteeism and turnover and workplace stress and the World Economic Forum has papers on this. So there are tons of papers and there are tons of working groups and there are tons of concern about the enormous economic and physical costs of this. What nobody has yet done is actually try to fix the problem. Well, it's interesting as well, isn't it? Because I think one of the things we've, you, you mentioned is we've addressed in the workplace many of the safety issues. Um, and what we need to look at now is actually, well, the, the health and the wellness issues, but in particular, uh, the mental health issues. Yes, that's because mental health has, of course, a physical outcome. Um, I mean, I have a colleague in the psychiatry department here who's a psychologist who can show you the different uh, she does neuroimaging, and you can see the, the you can see the different the, the brain effects of stress and depression. So this is not some you know th th these are, these have real physiological consequences. To having st stress leads to constantly elevated cortisol, which leads to cellular death. Um, stress also leads to a bunch of behaviors: smoking, drinking, alcohol abuse. Um, uh, overeating, not getting enough exercise, etc., which also have physiological effects. So this is a substantial problem, which is costing a lot of money. The, many of the estimates are somewhere between 60 and 85 percent of chronic uh, of the healthcare spend in the world is on chronic disease. And as I said before, chronic disease comes a lot from stress and the behaviors that stress causes. So if you want to fix the worldwide soaring healthcare costs, we need to address issues in the workplace. Okay, and that's, um, well, so let me talk, uh, just got move on to a related point. Um, and that is the fact that many workplaces actually have got wellness programs and healthcare programs um, that actually are trying to help employees address their behaviors. But in doing that, are they really passing the blame to the individual and not really addressing their cause because it's the stress of the workplace that causes those behaviors, is it not? That's exactly correct. And one of the reasons why the evidence suggests that these health and wellness programs are most, for the most part, quite ineffective is because we know from the quality movement, we know from medicine, we know from a variety of different domains that prevention is a much more effective strategy than remediation. And many of these efforts are attempts to remediate or somehow deal with um, the, the symptoms rather than dealing with the underlying causes of economic insecurity and work family conflict and too many work hours, et cetera. So how do you actually think that we're gonna bring about any change and address this situation? What do you think will be the turning point? Well, it's hard for me to predict the future, but I would suggest that one of two things are gonna happen or maybe both things will happen. First of all, in countries with national 
healthcare systems, such as the UK or Ireland or Australia or New Zealand, governments are going to say, we cannot afford the soaring healthcare costs. And since the health soaring healthcare costs come largely from chronic disease, and chronic disease comes largely from stress, and stress comes largely from work, there is going to be, which is not necessarily going to be the best way to do it, but there will be government regulation and government intervention to try to get companies to clean up uh, their act, so to speak. So the and, the second, and, the, and the second thing that I think might happen is that um, just as there have been uh, you know, legal suits over tobacco and et cetera, uh, there is a litigation risk that I think companies face because the, you know, just as in, in the case of tobacco, there is going back decades now, very strong epidemiological evidence in probably close to a thousand studies of the effects of these workplace exposures on health and health outcomes and including mortality. So sooner or later, uh, companies are gonna be called into account if they don't do something to get ahead of this problem. I think you suggested the difficulty and the reason why there hasn't been more lawsuits in the past is the, the uh, burden of proof in the case of, in individual cases. There's plenty of evidence looking at large scale surveys, but proving it in an individual situation is more challenging. Uh, that is true, but as we know from the tobacco litigation, um, you don't have to prove it in an individual case. I mean, all you need to do is prove that smoking causes cancer and that somebody smoked and then you could, so, so, so the, that as a defense is probably uh, not gonna last forever. And also I think governments um, will sooner or later um, do something about this because of the, of the cost that they're bearing. And finally, I think intelligent companies are gonna say, you know, the indirect cost that we are paying through absenteeism and presenteeism and turnover is so large that we can't afford to do this anymore, particularly because most of the things that are harming people don't help the companies. The evidence is quite clear. The long work hours are negatively related to productivity. The layoffs don't increase stock price, profitability, or productivity. That, um, that, that not giving people autonomy on their job is not, is, is, is harmful uh, to employee engagement and to motivation. So a lot of the things that we've done that make people sick don't benefit companies either. So we have truly created lose-lose situations. Yeah, it's definitely a lose-lose situation, but it's been like that for a long time. So it's interesting, you know, it, it, it's difficult to see uh, why companies don't understand that there's a, a, a competitive advantage to be had by addressing this problem. It's not a cost issue as much as a, a loss of opportunity issue. No, that's exactly right. And that's, so one of the reasons why I wrote Dying for a Paycheck is to try to highlight uh, this issue and to try to get people uh, to pay more attention to it. And we'll see if I'm successful or not, but you know, other people are, <coughs> I'm sure gonna write books and you're gonna organize you know, workshops and conferences on this, and maybe if enough people uh, bring enough attention to this, uh, things will change. The, uh, the other point I was gonna make as well is that although in the past maybe it's been more challenging to make a direct link in individual cases, with the use of new technologies and wearables, and, and uh, that's gonna be a problem that can be overcome in individual cases. The direct link will be provable uh, as we collect more data, and companies need to wake up to that fact as well, yeah? I think that's exactly correct. Um, okay, well, I, I, I think we've covered, from my, from my point of view, some of the really key issues that came out of the book. There's so much more in the book and I would encourage anybody to read it. Um, it's, it's scary, but it's optimistic. You give uh, 10, I think it was, um, things we need to do to start to address these problems. Clearly, we don't have the time to go through the whole list of 10, so people will need to read the book if they want to know that. But can you say what you think is the first thing we need to do? What, what would be the first thing you would say to the CEO of a large organization they should do? And what's the biggest opportunity for a, a quick win? I think there are two things. Uh, first of all, I think people need to understand that they are responsible uh, for the lives, literally the lives, 
and certainly the psychological well-being, but also the physical well-being and literally the mortality of the people who have come to work for them. So the first thing people need to do is they need to recognize, as one of my friends says, every company is in the healthcare business because every company is in the healthcare business because the people that you report to at work are as important for your health, more important for your health than, than your family doctor. So the first thing people need to do is they need to t recognize this responsibility and take it seriously. I guess, the thing, hmm? I guess they need to treat and protect their employees like they would their own children. Well, or like they would their horses or their, you know, I mean, I have a friend who does leadership training using horses and she says the people on the horses are treated much worse. If she treated the horses like the companies are treating their employees, there would be people picketing her. The second thing I think companies, <laughs> That's it's sad, but true. I think the yeah. second thing companies need to do is they need to measure. Um, the, you know, I think we have learned again from Management 101 and from the quality movement that things that don't get me measured really degrade and things that do get measured uh, we pay attention to and tend to improve. And so we need to measure employee health and well-being. A single item measure of self-reported health prospectively predicts mortality and morbidity. There are well-developed measures of these various workplace dimensions. Um, you can measure your employees if you, uh, in the United States, if you use a health benefits administrator or elsewhere, you can use, you know, perhaps national data. You can, you can measure, uh, do, do, are my employees, you know, uh, relying a lot on antidepressants? That should tell you something. If you're, when, when people are in physical and psychological pain, they medicate and they go to the doctors and get medicines. So if you got people taking sleeping pills and ADHD drugs and antidepressants, that should tell you something about the workplace that you created and maybe you ought to fix it. So I would say measurement and taking people's and people taking their responsibility to their employees seriously uh, and being good stewards of their human, the, the, the human element just as they become much better stewards of the envir environmental element, the elements of the physical environment, are the two things that I would really recommend. Okay, and the final question I'll just ask is, you suggest in the book as well, this is also a human rights issue. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and people need, look, people need to look out for themselves if their companies aren't doing it for them. So, you know, I have a friend who's on antidepressants. She started one week after she joined her employer, and she said, what should I do? I said, you need to go to a place where you can thrive. I mean, you would, you know, if a, if a room were filling up with smoke, you know, you would not say, how can I stay in this room? You would get out of the room. Well, you know, the workplace, many of these workplace conditions are literally as hazardous to health as secondhand smoke. You need to, 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 to the extent possible to find a place which is going to be good for your physical and mental health. Because once you've been in a situation which has degraded your mental and physical health, recovery is going to be much more difficult and by the way, more expensive than prevention. So we've got a human right to expect employers to treat us well, but if, if they don't, we should go and find them somewhere else to work. That's exactly correct. Okay, excellent. Well, I think that's been a very good overview of the book. Thanks very much for your time today. And um, well, hopefully we'll speak again soon. It's a thank you. It's a pleasure right. to see you. And I hope one day we'll actually meet in person.